remember, act natural. Okay, you okay, do. Brian, Brian. Yeah. We're geniuses because we figured out how to do this. Yeah, we're we, podcast experts, not amateurs. This is our first take, Craig. What are you talking about? Yeah, exactly. No one knows about the other five takes where we couldn't even figure out how to turn our microphones on. Right? What are we doing, Craig, and who are we? Brian, we are a Texas Truck Show podcast, Texas Truck Channel podcast. I don't know. What are we? Texas Truck Podcast. Let's just go with that. Texas Truck TTP. Texas Truck Podcast. This is episode 26. <laughs> um, maybe the second or third Texas Truck Podcast officially, but uh, we had a lot of Brake Check okay. Show podcasts before that. For those that don't know, and I think most of y'all do by now, Brake Check Show is Texas Truck Channel or Texas Truck Podcast. Because we live in Texas, and Brian, there's a lot of trucks. And it makes sense. Texas trucks, big. I mean, come on. Um, so that's where we're at, and that's what's going on there. Um, but we've got some stuff to talk about. It's now, been a minute. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, let's just clarify. We're truck people in the truck region, and that's why we're sitting in front of not trucks right now. Because Well, I mean, <laughs> I mean they've they got the tr- world. truck platforms. <laughs> I mean, trucks, yes. good. Well, To okay. be clear, there are pickup trucks. That have beds, you know, yeah. that you can, you know, yep. move stuff, haul around, roll in the hay in. And then there are SUVs based on trucks that are still trucks. Right. And what, what I mean by that, Craig, and for our audio only listeners here, um, because by the way, we're filming a video portion of this too, we are sitting in front of our personal SUVs, and Texas Truck Channel encompasses both trucks and SUVs, just so we're clear. Absolutely. I mean, Full framey, off roady things. Yes, which means it could also be an EV if you had to. Well, do you want to start that? Is it too soon? I'm just saying it could. You could have an EV SUV or EV truck. We've driven both of them. We've driven both of them. Yep, we really have uh, a lot. And we both have had some thoughts about EV, Craig. Let's just jump into it. That's a good place to start. How do you feel about EV in the world today? Oh, man, I don't know if I'm ready for this entire rant. I've got to formulate my thoughts, but. <laughs> I, don't, I, okay. I guess I've done enough. I don't know if it'll take too long. So, Brian, here's what I'm going to say, and that is quit lying to me. Okay? What okay. I mean by quit lying to me, okay. and this thought hit me. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a rant. I am really apologize for the audience, but tune out now. You can jump back in in a minute. But Yeah, come back in about 40 minutes. And so there, in our area, there's this train crossing that crosses the highway. And, which is fun. It happens in a lot of places. A lot of train crossings. That's no big deal. This is not a big deal. Except that this is also, the the railroad has decided to just make this a yard, a depot. Like, they can back and forth and stop traffic whenever they feel like it. And, like, this is a main thoroughfare that they have decided to block. And when it blocks, traffic backs up for literally miles. And you could be stuck there for literally 30 minutes to an hour at a time. While I'm sitting there in my EV that we had on loan at that particular week, I started thinking, wait a minute, um, we don't need a bunch of EVs. We need better traffic flow because meanwhile around me, I've got all these gas cars idling like a madman and we all this energy to stop, take back off. That's not saving anything. You could improve corporate cafe fuel economy regulations if we didn't sit there for an hour and have a 500 cars backed up idling, that's insane. Right. Even with the auto start stop, it doesn't work because after two minutes, it's back on, right? So, well, well, you need air conditioning in Texas, so that just doesn't work unless you have a hybrid that runs. Well, even those kick back on. Yeah. You only sit so long. You know, a compressor has to spin if it's a traditional AC my, unit. Yeah, and my, so my point is that I think I called you after that. I just started cursing the, everything and. I was like, this sure. is all a farce. We don't, everybody talks about trying to get an extra mile per gallon out of every car and we, all these regulations. We've got to switch everything to EV. No, we need better traffic flow at stoplights, intersections, you name it. Yeah. How many times have you been in a city or a certain area and you just like this, these traffic lights aren't timed right? We can't get, we can, we can oh, get, self, we're, we're trying to at get all. self driving cars, but we can't get a freaking sensor on a freaking light. You got to be kidding me. We don't have cameras that can see, oh, there's 50 cars backed up and only two trying to turn left. Maybe we should let 40 cars through before we let two cars turn left. That's my point that they're all lying or to us. Let that car turn and left so, on yield for once. Don't there stop. There you go. Anybody. That's where I'm at um, on EVs. And uh, yeah. I'm not saying we don't need them. I'm just saying 
there are other things we can do besides ruining cars and making this all switch to EVs to save some fuel and energy. I'm all about saving energy and reducing global warming. I'm not against that. So, yeah. Well, and those that don't know, Craig, you're the thing you drive the most. You're not impressed. Cars is a Mazda two. That is an efficient gasoline car, and you've had it for since you bought it new in mm-hmm. 2011, mm-hmm. right? Several hundred thousand miles mm-hmm. on it. I'm sorry, that's way greener than buying the new, latest, expensive, heavy electric vehicle. It just is. You're, if you kept that car longer and drove it and maintained it, you're going to be greener on the earth by not producing something new from scratch, by not mining batteries. And let's, let's just park that argument for a minute and let's talk about your, your red light situation slash train situation. After your train rant, Craig, I can't quit thinking about it. In fact, I blame Dad for all of this because he, he raised us with this whole, well, they've got their rules and I've got mine kind of nonsense mentality, which has been an underlying theme of our lives the entire time. And so I don't know about you, Craig, but when I pull up to the stoplight and it's late at night and I'm the only freaking car with an eyesight, <laughs> I'm running that light. It has now become a stop yeah. sign. And I do this several times a week. It happens all the time. And I've just realized that these intelligent stoplights that don't have sensors don't know more than I do. I have sensors. They work. They work better than autonomous driving vehicles. When you drive an, a, an AV, an autonomous vehicle, um, they don't work, Craig. They drive like they're drunk most of the time, especially in like urban settings. On a highway, they're starting to get there. But when I drive to work, there's no way, even in our press cars, that I can have it take me there. And that's just, just how it is. There's Gary right there. Yeah. yeah. So there's the Mazda 2 in question. Um, but what I'm getting at, I've started counting stoplights on my way to work, Craig. So the way that I go most of the time, any guesses how many stoplights I pass going through on the way to work? Uh, knowing you and your route, uh, you've probably got it down to a couple, three? Five. And this is the shortest, least amount of stoplights I can take. And I'm taking roundabout ways to avoid them. The if I take the traditional route, Craig, it happens to be on the same road that you're bitching about with the uh, <laughs> or complaining about with the train, uh, the other end of it, the four side of it. How many stoplights do you think if I go that way? Eight. <laughs> Wrong. Thirteen. <laughs> Thirteen stoplights, Craig. It's absurd. And guess what? They're all wrong. Every time I get to them, more than half the time, they're doing something wrong. Yeah, how many times do you, there's several you, I come across. you get stopped at it, and then you don't get to go to the next three. you got to stop at the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one. Right. And no one's waiting. They're it's, just You're timed it because yeah. they, don't, they can't put a sensor on time, you go, well, Right. There's one I go by in the morning. There's actually three in a row. Just what you said, the, the sequence through Benbrook there. Mm-hmm. I go, oh, it went red. There's no one even trying to come from an opposing road. There's no one there. It's simply a trigger that's not correct. And so I'm sitting here, I'm kind of going, there's got to be a better way. And maybe that timer makes sense during rush hour. But in the morning when I go to work, that doesn't make sense. Now, let's back it up. There's other stoplights, Craig, on the same highway we're discussing, which is not that bad of a highway. But there's some stoplights to neighborhoods that don't exist yet that are coming on this road. And it will trigger for one car turning left. And there's a median that can be used to make this turn. And it will stop almost 100 cars. Mm-hmm. To let one car turn left. Are you telling me this human being is not competent enough to merge with the flow of traffic? If you lost your mind, uh, if you can't merge into, into existing traffic, you don't need a driver's license. I mean... Thus, we don't need that stoplight. Right. Come on. Exactly. No. Okay. Uh, one more piece of the rant, and, and, and then I'll stop about stoplights. Uh, if you can't make it and you accidentally die in that car wreck, then that might be the way it needs to be. <laughs> Maybe you've been weeded out of the driver's we, pool. We don't need you on you the road. You get a Darwin today. Award, and we all are better. But uh, you know, it, look, maybe a dog could drive better. So. Yeah. Okay. Hey. <laughs> um, maybe it can coexist. Yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah, and to your point about tra- right. traffic lights along the way, I used to have zero. I, I live a little farther out. I used to have mm-hmm. zero. It was w- glorious, and it still is because I still only have one. Actually, I was going to say, now you have well, one. No, actually, I can, and you can, I can still go away where I have zero. But there's one at an intersection that I could go. And it's to turn left. It used to be a blinking yellow. Okay. Mm. Blinking yellow, one way. Which meant yield. Means yield. And yeah. then if you're on the main thoroughfare, you just keep yeah. going. You get the right away. It worked. Right. There was a few wrecks there over the years that yeah. weren't good because people didn't pay attention, didn't understand what that meant. Um, and it's, there's not a bad traffic there situation, but... 
I find myself routinely stuck in the left turn lane with no one around me. I just have to go because this is, again, we're wasting right. energy, fuel, this stopping, is, where before I wouldn't even yeah. stop and keep going. You know how much fuel that burns? If you're a hypermiling, stopping oh. is the worst thing you can do. So You're starting from scratch again. So yeah. the whole point of hypermiling is taking that rotational mass that you've generated by burning fossil fuel, igniting it, and turning it into twist energy, and then not turning it into heat energy by slamming on the brakes and turning all that forward momentum into heat. That if you're, if you like to, I want to bring it back to your point of stop lying to me. <laughs> if we as a nation care about efficiency in reducing energy waste, get rid of these stoplights or at least minimize them, make them more intelligent. And if we're able to automate so many things in this world, look, if you work in manufacturing, which we both do, we know that automation can be done in a good way. This is a bad example of automation. The stoplight is not better than the human eye. It just isn't. It is not proven to be correct. Um, and that applies darn near everywhere. I mean, it's just so frequent that it's, Craig, I'll run stoplights with children in the car. And they go, Dad, that light wasn't working. I go, you're right, son. You're the smartest kid on the planet. You know exactly what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not complicated. <laughs> brainwash. But anyway. Uh, so that's my rant. No. And that's kind of just where I'm at there. I, there's obviously more to that. But there, we got more episodes to save some of those rants for. So, you know. Um, yeah, but we, let's park the EV thing for a minute because that's part of it. Yes, too, but so. the main reason we really wanted to have a podcast, Brian, is because we had a the Texas Truck Rodeo, um, which you were heavily involved in helping set up because you're a member of the Texas Auto Riders Association board, uh, one of the the, mm-hmm. the event mm-hmm. coordinator, if I've got that right. Um, I'm sure there's a different title for it, but you're in charge of events. Something, something yeah, like something that, like yeah. That. Right. Um, and there's a lot went into it. A lot of uh, manufacturers were there. Um get to drive a lot of new things and compare them back to back. And the ultimate uh, goal of this event is we vote on the Texas truck of the year, the Texas SUV of the year. And you probably have seen that mm-hmm. advertised last year was the Tundra and years past you've seen Rams um, advertise that oh, yeah. award. It's a big deal for the manufacturers to win that. I am sad to report that some manufacturers are afraid to lose. And so they don't enter. I'm just going to say that. I'm just going to call it out. It is what it is. Yep. Um, yep. And so, and, I, and we won't mention who those are, but, there's some people that won't win, but just because they didn't even show up. So you can't win if you don't show up. That's how it works. Yeah. There, I'll say it. There's two in particular that choose not to win. That's exactly what's going on here. Yeah. I, 100%. Yeah. Uh, and we we'll won't get into all the details, and, and we can talk off camera because there's more to that, actually, that I <laughs> learned recently. But anyways, let's, uh, let's keep moving on past that. But there are two that are very valid in the truck marketplace that choose not to win. Correct. Um, by not participating. Correct. So, so yeah, I would like to way. talk about that event. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about what we got to do at the event, maybe, and then we'll talk about some of our favorite and maybe not so favorites, because you know this is what this podcast is for. We get to yeah some things we don't get to film. Uh, we get to talk talk about here. So give a little background on the actual event, what we get to do, and then we'll share some of our moments. Sure. Yeah. Let's let's talk trucks uh, because with the truck radio, that's what we're talking about. So the Texas Auto Riders is an organization. Um, and keep in mind that name was designed uh, when writing about cars was the only way to be a journalist. Now you have YouTube, you have short form stuff, TikTok, Instagram reels, all that kind of stuff. Um, and the reality is buyers in our generation are not looking at print for vehicle uh, feedback. So that name may be changing a few decades from now, but just know that this organization captures automotive journalists in the Texas region. Even though we have a national reach, we have people all across the country that are members. Anyways, once a year, we have what's called the Truck Rodeo. And if you've listened to this podcast before, we've talked about the Auto Roundup. That's our spring event. The Truck Rodeo is the fall event. And we basically take all the trucks and SUVs and cool stuff and put them in the dirt and test them out thoroughly. Um, We can also take them on road. We can take them on a highway loop around. And this year, we actually ended up at a new facility. This is really the big headline here. This has been handled in Austin for the last four or five years at a, actually a wedding venue where, God, what show was that? The Walking Dead filmed a scene mm-hmm. there. So there was like a ghost mm-hmm. town that was in the facility. It's kind of cool. It was a cool photogenic place, but it was really small. And if you ever flew a drone, you'd find like a random piece of equipment behind the trees that we weren't looking at, like a trailer or a storage building and just random stuff like that. It wasn't a good fit um, moving forward. And so... There we go. There's some truck radio stuff. And that's the old venue. So the new venue was moved from Austin to the DFW area all the way up in Decatur, Texas at Eagles Canyon Raceway. And it was uh, was cool. So there's actually a 
Ford Raptor racetrack that we rented out. And we also added a bunch of obstacles adjacent to it. So you could take things like a Volkswagen Tiguan, Craig, and you could take it on a, a axle twister obstacle and get wheels in the air. There's Tiguan right there. Uh, get wheels in the air and do some cool stuff like that. Do some things that crossovers can have fun doing and feel their, their flex or lack of, and their traction systems working. You can get a tire completely off the ground where left to its own devices would just get the car stuck and let the system pull itself through. It's pretty cool to experience that. Then we had things that go up from there. We have um, sl side slopes you can drive on. They're, they're side angles and it makes you feel like you're going to flip over. They also had rock gardens for the more serious off-roaders, your Jeeps and your Forerunners and uh, really every, actually every Toyota product that showed up this year could do every single obstacle. That was pretty cool. That was kind of, I was talking to, to Toyota after the fact. I was like, yeah, it was a good flex. They go, yeah, it worked out that way. But we, we, it was fun to stand up and tell everyone all of our stuff can do all of it. And um, that was cool. And that meant also the water pit, Craig. The water pit was cool. That was about a foot and a half deep. And you did a 21 or 22 degree hill climb where you're looking straight in the sky before you dip into it and check that out. Um, and then after that, we had a part of the Raptor racetrack we use. There's a, a bowl you can drive through at higher speed. And then there's some whoops and twists and that kind of stuff that we let every car go on. And that was a ton of fun. Um, now, as far as video is concerned, Craig, if you're a journalist and you're interested in something like this for next year, what we did this year that was new is we hired a videographer to come out. Um, Eric Ohana with, um, with One Off Productions came out and brought his... Uh, co-shooter and they flew an fpv drone which is super cool very car commercial-esque and uh i think craig i don't know about you but one of the most fun parts was the, the last couple hours of the last day i told them we can get some action shots because we're we need some action clips for some things we're doing with hawa and we literally said grab grab the brightest colored things you and me and another journalist Corey from gt garage talk who we, we trust behind the wheel mm -hmm. of the vehicle with more than 20 miles an hour and said, let's go and get some dust and let's do that. And it was cool. It was a ton of fun. I had a lot of fun with that. I think you did too. And um, that was pretty much it. But the new venue was neat. And I really liked the variety because you have, you know, the gauntlet of vehicles. We had EVs. We had Genesis with their GV60, which was a ton of fun on the highway. I've got a story about that. We can tell later if you want. That was fun. Um, and then we had things like your family haulers. You had luxury stuff. You had luxury off-road stuff. Uh, we had the new Hurricane inline six from Stellantis, which is in the Wagoneers. That's a big deal. The Ram Rebel 2500. We were the first group in the country to drive it. The national launch is actually happening next week from today when we're recording this podcast. Hasn't even happened yet. And we were able to get it under embargo and test it and film it. In fact, you and I have a full episode film that we can't even publish yet because of the embargo. Um, but that was cool. It was fun to get those first chances. And that, that's kind of the fun part of Tawa as we... Uh, we get a lot of fun opportunities with the brands that we work with. So I, I liked it. I don't know what your take was because you've done the last venue and this one now. I don't know what your your take was. You know, I thought it was great. I, I liked both venues. I thought uh, this venue was probably better suited to actually fully test them a little better. Well, not fully test them, but test them in a more – an environment that's more likely for the vehicle to be more seen likely. in. Um, the previous environment yeah. was not very long. It was short, so you didn't get to stretch the vehicle's legs much. So, so you didn't get a good feel for it before you're immediately into a very technical obstacle, which no one, most people will never put the car through, which was neat to see the vehicles right. be able to do some of those things. But it wasn't a good real-world test, I thought. So, um, no, it was a lot of fun. Loved it. Great test. Um, great venue. Uh, if you have a chance to go out there and do anything at Eagles Canyon, whether it's on the off-road course, Raptor course, road course, that place is cool. We, uh, I highly encourage going there no matter yeah. what your automotive reason you're going. <laughs> so um, that part was awesome. Um, now the vehicles themselves, you mentioned the Ram 2500 Rebel. That was really neat to be able to get our hands on that. Um, when, when does the embargo lift on that? Do you have that off the top of your head? I don't have it in front of me. I think it's okay. Next so pretty week. soon, here pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, because the drives haven't happened. The national right. drives haven't happened yet for it. So they're supposed to happen. In fact, it might be happening first wave today or tomorrow. But I think it's this week. But the actual video, so like your TFL guys, your Truck King, these big truck outlets that we we mix and mingle with Savage Geese, those guys, if they're going to go mm -hmm. to it, um, they can't put their stuff out any sooner right. than we can, and we can't put it any sooner than they can. That's the whole point of an embargo. It allows every journalist to have a chance to create something. Right, and that way, 
when it does come out. I mean, if you want some Ram 2500 coverage, you're going to get it from everybody. So you're going to get a lot. So it is a pretty neat yeah. way to do it. Um, I'm okay with embargoes. They don't bother me. Um, no, they're great. They're a tool. They yeah. help everybody. And, and also it gives the brand to go, look, it's like, Hey, when something comes out, it's their day. They, that's their day. Hey, this is Ram Rebel Day. All the right. outlets are covering this all at once. It gives them some impact. Right. So that's pretty cool. Um, so let's let's just dive into some of the vehicles we got to drive. Um, and those are, okay. uh, Brian, we had the Tundra. Let's see if I can pull some pictures up here again real quick. Um, yeah, the TRD yeah, Pro. Uh, yeah. Um, which, which, by the way, we're getting that on loan next week for us to test uh, just for our channel. Yes, so, looking forward to that. Um, me too. We got it for Halloween, Greg. It's orange with black wheels. It's not it's orange. It's not orange. It's got a color. Oh, excuse me. Solar octane. Right. <laughs> um, metallic burning sun. It is awesome. I'll be honest with you. I keep thinking back about... Actually, I'm not even thinking about the Tundra. I'm thinking about the Sequoia. That orange Sequoia, which we did a video on, which has done quite well. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a really cool... Oh, there you go. There's a good yeah, picture. This, and this is a good picture. Um, this is the two Sequoias and a Tundra. It's hard to tell, but yeah. Right. Little, uh, hey, little inside baseball here. You see those two sequoias you mm -hmm, have on the screen mm -hmm. there, Craig? The white mm -hmm. and the orange. Those are not actually press fleet vehicles, which is where we get most of these vehicles from. Those are engineering <laughs> test mules. And so our PR rep from Toyota was very adamant because, you know, I work with all of them leading up to the event getting vehicles in here. He was adamant. These cannot get damaged. They have to go back. Um, and one of them was for an in-house Toyota event that had, it could not be scratched. In fact, it was the orange one that could mm -hmm. not be scratched. And, um, and I told him, well, look, Greg, I'm, you have to be viable for your vehicles on the track. And I, I think that that's great. Um, and this track is way less abusive to cars than last year's track, but I want you to take it through the obstacle and approve it. And he brought two engineers, Craig, with that vehicle before our event to the track with private access to make sure it could clear. And it did totally fine. Uh, but being a test mule where parts are not available to repair, it had to be checked out. That was kind of cool that they even let us get yeah. into it. So that was No, neat. it was really neat. And so, yeah, the Solar Octane, I don't really like those bright colors, but I thought it was a great color. I think it's a great package. Um, and so, do you want to dig into the Toyotas that we got to drive and which one was your favorite? Or Yeah, let's just yeah, go I mean, We're not going to go through all yeah. the cars, but like, well... I'm going to do this. Let's do this because this is what we do after every event. Uh, when, we, when we were kids, uh, this is yes. what we do. We would, look, a little history on the Rock Brothers and why they like cars so much. We would go to dealers um, when they were closed because you don't Sunday want to be able to salesman because yep. they're just annoying and they don't let you do what you want with the car. And we, So, yeah, usually Sunday sure. afternoon or late at night in the summer. It's hot. It's nothing to do. And Dad would pay us like a quarter every car we found unlocked. And so we would walk the entire lot. Yep. If we found a car unlocked, he would pay us a quarter. And we thought that was a lot of money. I guess it was back then. And we would... Inflation. <laughs> Inflation, correct. Um, I have to pay my kids 50 cents now. It's really bad. But anyways. And so oh, we'd no. find a car unlocked and we would get in it and we would just touch every button we could. I'm sure we ran some batteries down playing with them. <laughs> I'm sure the dealers didn't like this. But oh, yeah. um, you really... <laughs> what you got to do is you really got to feel for some cars. You got to... Put the seat where you want it and see if you fit in it and see if you know you got to do a butt test in the driver's seat in every car without you didn't obviously didn't get to drive it but that was really neat and a lot of fun and so what we would do when we left those we would always ask each other okay you get to leave with one which one are you taking and then we would go to yeah m money no object by the way it was yeah. always money no object you just right. got to take it home and then so then we do, we do we do the same thing in auto shows growing up and then now we're into this doing this uh, as a side gig <laughs> And uh, so I'll just ask you the same question from this event. Brian, you get to take one vehicle home from this event. Um, which one's it going to be? I want to tell people more of what was you there may, first, Yeah, let's right? mention some of the okay? vehicles that were there. Okay, the so contenders. just a quick rundown. And the contenders. And by the way, we've had a lot of these on loan already. So if you're a follower of us or you've watched our content, you probably are familiar with some of these. Um, let's go down the total on it. They had the Forerunner. They had the... Um, Tacoma, Tundra, Sequoia. What else do they have? Oh, the Lexus GX. I'm sorry, LX 600 yes. was there, not the GX. The LX 600, which we have had that. That's amazing. Um, that was pretty much Toyota. They had multiple Sequoias, but they had more right. units there. Um, Ram had two limited 1500s, one gas, one diesel. They had two TRXs, which surprisingly didn't get driven as much as I thought they would. They had the Ram Rebel 2500, diesel. which was... 
a first in the country uh, diesel, the Cummins, which is basically what makes the Rebel. But you can get a Rebel gas, gas, just to be clear. Yeah, and you can tow and a lot more to do that. But yeah, that's and you get a winch, which the diesel won't let you do that because of cooling <laughs> side ramp. Go watch our video. We've covered that. We've covered that. Um, but that that was the headliner from Ram. Um, we had Nissan had the Frontier, which I still love the Frontier on like trails like that because it's it's the right size and it's easy to place and that kind of stuff. And it did surprisingly well. Although I did ask them to remove the side hoops. Uh, you know how you can take the side steps off and then it's just mm-hmm. a good rock rail. It was mm-hmm. awesome. When we had it on loan, we talked about it. Ours was two-wheel drive, but it had those hoops that would just bust your shin mm-hmm. trying to get into it. Well, guess what? You pop those hoops off, and now, now it's just a Which, by the way, the Ranger rail. Trimmer has the same exact that. problem. So, yeah. Oh, totally. And it's just as right. brilliant when you take the steps off, too. So, um, uh, that, that's, Those are kind of like the off-road. Hell- oh, Jeep. I'm thinking of Jeep, Craig. Can't forget them. Um, the 4xE Rubicon Wrangler, um, which I say I didn't even drive that thing. I didn't get around to it. Uh, Wanted to, but didn't get around to it. The Wagoneers with the new Hurricane inline twin turbo six, which is pretty cool. Uh, both the Obsidian and the Series Two. The Series Two is like the off roady one. It has basically the locking diffs and the eighteen inch wheels instead of twenty twos and that kind of stuff. I think those are kind of your headliners. Volkswagen was there. The Atlas, uh, Tiguan. Did uh, you mention what else the Subaru? Have the Rock Creek Pathfinder. Oh no, the Subaru Forester. No, uh, I did get to drive that. We did not film that. Um, we'll leave that there. Well, we, we there's some a, footage. Let's just say it wasn't a content. It, there's some footage. There's actually, you know what? There is yeah. some footage, Craig. Mm. There's actually more footage than I, I think there should be. But timing was mm. interesting on that. Yeah. Anyways, it did make it to the pit. Mm. I'll tell you that. It took its time, but it got through. You mentioned the Mazdas, right? Uh, so there's like uh, the Mazdas. Oh, yeah. CX-50. Yes, of course it was there. It did surprisingly well, too. Uh, so those are kind of your Hyundai's, contenders. You the Hyundai's. Uh, your big boys. No, oh, dang, I forgot Hyundai. The Palisade XRT. That was also a first drive. No one in the country had driven that yet. Um, so yeah, some cool stuff. I think those are. Let's just. That's enough for okay. contenders. Okay. Don't you think? Anything uh, else on this? Genesis. Things? Like, almost, oh yeah, GV60 electric. Yeah, man, we had a lot of cars there. It was more than mm-hmm. I thought we did, but. Um, yeah, but that was an on-road option, but certainly an option still. I think Ionic Five, but way nicer and faster. Yeah. Um, has a boost has a boost function kind of like the BMW i4 uh, M50 right. has a little bit similar to that, but you have to hold the boost button down on the steering wheel instead of it just being the the dead pedal extra step. Okay. So kind of gimmicky, kind yeah. of fun, entertaining. Uh, a little bit of oversteer with that too. It's like pretty that. cool. Yeah. Um, so those are your your that's kind of the important ones. There's some more in there I'm missing, but they're more those are more like crossover. Oh, God dang it, forgot that one. Acura, um, the Type S, what was it? The, uh, the MDX, MDX Type yes. S? I actually like that quite a bit. I kept thinking Audi Q7 the whole time I was mm. driving that. Um, it, it, it was pretty good. Um, so, yeah, so contenders as truck guys, Craig, I think let's call it the top five in my mind are going to be your T-Rex, your Rebel, your Tundra, your Sequoia. Um, and, again, as a truck guy, maybe let's throw a Wagoneer in there, too. I think that was a pretty viable contender as well. Um I can't believe I'm saying this. I think Sequoia is what I wanted to take home. The orange Sequoia. I'm sorry. Solar Octane Sequoia is what I keep thinking about mm. after the event. The day we left, I didn't quite feel that way. But in hindsight, now that it's been about two weeks, man, that was just a cool family hauler. What a cool gig. Mm-hmm. And I don't like hybrids. This was a hybrid, but it did a really good job at not telling you it was a hybrid. It just went. Yeah. No, it was great. So that, that's your favorite. That's your pick. Yeah, it sounds like a sea doo, but yeah, I, I still think that's one I would. Do you take. remember wh- what you <laughs> voted for? Do you want to, or do you want to reveal that? Um, yeah, I can reveal that. I know the the high level stuff. Actually, I know who won. I can tell. I, I can't tell you that, but I do know who won. Don't announce that. that yet. But um, the title awards that's November first. That'll go public. But yeah, it, it was interesting. Not who I thought I was going to. I'll, okay. I'll say that on some of them. Okay, some of them. but who did you vote for? So what about you? Um, I voted for on the truck of Texas. I think I voted uh, Rebel or Tundra. I can't remember which one I did. I can't um, remember. I, I know I texted you mine. I'm trying to find it. No, actually, I pulled yours up um, on the back end the other day because I was curious. We we differed on two votes. Everything else was almost. Oh, the same. we did differ. Good. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, but I will tell you that the SUV of Texas I voted was Sequoia. And it's not just because it's the newest thing. It, well, it is a little bit of that because it's just the most current in a lot of ways. Um, but also, I think it was a more approachable package. The Wagoner is really impressive too, but its price point is so high. No. That it makes it hard for a lot of masses to have an option on, on that. Otherwise, I think it's a really good option. Okay, so you voted for SUV of the year. You voted for Sequoia, but the one you would take home yeah. is the Hurricane? I'm, I'm sorry, the Wagoneer? No, no, the one I would take home is still Oh, I'm sorry, it's Sequoia. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right, I was looking... Out of the whole event, the Sequoia, the Sequoia is what I would keep thinking about. Okay. On most. But it's got to be the TRD Pro. It's got to be the whole, you know, the orange and the wheels and the, the red suspension parts. and Yeah, it's got to be the $70,000 um, one. Yeah, that one, which is still cheaper than a lot of its competition somehow. That, you know, that that is a good point. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, oh, i got a picture here of uh, something else. that reminded me of one of my rants about EVs. But <laughs> uh, anyways, I'll get off that. So, yeah. <laughs> So I think that's a great choice. The Sequoia TRD Pro it was so impressive, and I think the things I mean, another thing I liked about it was, wait, I can haul all these people. It rides good. It's got plenty of power, and it off roads right. as capable as it does. You're kidding me, right? And it's quick. Yeah, yeah, and it's quick as hell. I mean, it was there. We did zero sixty with the pre production on on the street park, Greg, at like six point two, yeah. something like that. Like it's insane. Six point two. Freaking it, insane. Off road, no obstacle was a challenge for it. It's based. It's a Land Cruiser L. Yeah, it's nice. extended. Right. Yes. And so the a next one that I like a lot is the Lexus LX, but that cost a bazillion dollars compared yeah. to. Yeah. And it has less room. Look, I know. The, and it has twenty twos, which are. Stupid. I know all the Toyota fanboys out there and the Land Cruiser fans of the world are so upset. I can't believe they killed an icon. There's no more Land Cruiser in the states. Blah 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 blah. blah. I, I get it. I understand their frustration. But you can get a Sequoia for twenty to $30,000 less than you used to be able to get a Land Cruiser. And right. there's and more the room? Time. What's the problem? One more thing. There's a locking rear diff. <laughs> right. It is the affordable. Land Cruiser didn't have that previously. It's not gen. like some... Right. Yeah. You had the center locking diff, which is... Which is just dumb. And by the way, you can't do a burnout in a Land Cruiser unless you take a drive shaft. Right. right. You can do a burnout in a Sequoia. You can drive them two-wheel drive. So yeah. I, I just, I like that better. I think that's Look, better. I've got uh, a Land Cruiser behind yeah. me, an 80 series, that I am going to, I yes. want to convert from full-time to part-time. And it's going to be a lot of work. Because I'll... Yeah. But in the Sequoia, it's already part-time. Full-time four-wheel drive is dumb. Like Let's just be honest. Be. We don't look. Maybe if you live on a mountain and you don't want to have the whole buckling of a locked center diff, like full. There are some applications for it. Hold on, I hate to to scare anyone here, Craig, but Ford and Ram have had an auto four wheel drive option. Uh, GM does it too, by the way. On that, oh, and GM too. Oh, Toyota's the only one that doesn't do it. So, little kick in the nuts (laughs) to Toyota on a Tundra or Sequoia. You can't do four auto with either of them. No matter what trim you get, it is. Too high, four high, four low. That's it. There's no four auto option. And, and the way that works is basically, I don't know who did it first, but I know how Ford's works. It's the same transfer case, but there's a clutch on the front drive shaft output. Yep. So it just locks the transfer case and yep. feathers The reason Toyota doesn't fine. do that is because then you would use four-wheel drive the wrong way and they don't want you to do that. You oh, got to follow all their steps. It's a... Oh, that's right. That's Look, right. Oh, we got a comment the other day on one of our Tacoma videos saying, oh, you didn't follow the, the procedure. There's too many procedures. <laughs> it's it's got stuck Look, in. This old piece of crap right. behind me does the same stuff. They've been doing it forever. And I've learned now, drive, really? I've driven enough Toyotas with all these press cars. I'm like, oh, wait, I'm not even going to try that. It's a Toyota. You have to do it in this order. And it works when you do that. But it's a bit cumbersome. Yeah, it does. No, yeah, it works. and it works every time, to be fair to Toyota. But... Like I can't just put it in the mode I want when I want. Well, this is, I maybe that's why they last longer because you can't tear them up as easy. I don't know, but it would be nice to do some things yeah. when you want versus when they make you do it. But whatever. So, look, let's part. We're already talking to it in this episode. <laughs> let's get to it, Craig. Um, I've joked for years, like with the previous Tundra, for example. It was huge in all the wrong places. Mm. They they made it for the big American, <laughs> in the way that Japan thought of America. Mm. As just short, fat people. Well, I am a tall, fat oh, person. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, my problem was I go to get in the truck and I'd hit my head. 
on the because the seat is too freaking high because it wants you to like give you a big man complex or a little man complex because the seat is tall within the cab. No, my head's just too tall to the roof now. It's a giant cab, Craig, but I'm four feet off the ground for no reason. And then it's so wide, I feel like I can't, I'm just like lost in the seat. It's bizarre. Mm -hmm. And then there's a ton of legroom in the second row. Forget the driver. The second row is huge. The limousine truck, the driver is like, you might might as well be in a freaking (laughs) Tacoma. It just, it made no sense to me. I was furious with Toyota for years, Craig. Years. You've heard me. You know. Um, Toyota doesn't want you to have any fun, is what I'm mm. getting at, once upon mm. a time. They, they don't want you to do, well, why would you need to lock the diff in mm-hmm. two-wheel drive? Because I want to do a burnout, dude. I want the both rear tires to light up. One-tire fires are lame. Mm. It's never crossed their mind at Toyota you would want to do that. It hasn't even been considered. God forbid you lock the diff in two-wheel drive. So those are things that are still there. Um, but some credit to the new Tundra. The front seat's amazing. The front row is really comfortable probably the best full-size front row on the planet right now. So they have fixed that. So maybe next year we can get a lot. To be fair, uh, you talked about the bowl earlier at the end. We got to do these, drive through this bowl so we get some footage. Um, I got stuck at the Ram, not the TRX. (laughs) I got the Ram Rebel, the diesel, not made for high-speed off-road, which that's fine, whatever. But I really don't know how that happened and. That, that, but that did happen. You kind of yeah. No, I really, I, I definitely get screwed on that. So that, there's no doubt about that. Um, oh, hang on. I gotta do my be real. I gotta do my be real. I want to do it real quick. You're gonna be on the be real with me. I don't even know what be real is. You know what be real is. Your your wife's on it. Get with the program. For those that don't know, if you wanna follow me on be real, I'm on there. So um, we're trying to stay hip at Texas Truck Channel. Um, but anyways, oh, is it te- Texas Truck Channel on be real? Whatever. Well, we can, maybe we should make that. Okay, maybe we should. Those that are okay. listening, let us know if we need to do that. That's a good idea. They can see the behind the scenes on Texas Truck Channel. Yeah, Steven, the one guy listening, let us know if we should do I'm just saying, it's an option. Um, okay. okay. Anyway, so I'm driving this Ram Rebel through the through the turn, and I've got, is, I'm trying to turn all the traction control off that I can. You and I drove it. We could not figure it out. Right. I couldn't do anything. I got it in tow mode. I got everything I could figure out. Couldn't do anything. I've tried to get it sideways, does it a little bit and immediately cuts in. I literally have my foot to the floor trying to, I'm trying to throw as much dust as I can for the camera and right. foot to the floor. Course. It wouldn't That's... go over 30 miles an hour. Shut up. Is that why you're going that slow? Yes. I thought you were just driving like you drive I, sometimes. I had the floor. It was matted through the whole turn. My God. So hey, I got to, I got to back, back this up real quick. Just so you guys know, I have made fun of Craig for driving slow sometimes um, because he's just being like sensible or something. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know why he's doing it, but he's doing it. But then whenever Craig is in something that is not his, if he does not own it, he might be the fastest person out there. I've seen him on go-kart tracks and go, who the hell was that? Where'd that guy come not from? my car. He was doing 10 under on the way over here to save droplets of fuel and not fuel money. That's what it's for. And you get in a go-kart track and you're freaking, you never lift your not foot off or you roll a side by side or, or whatever, you know? And once it's not yours, you're like, let's go. <laughs> and so I'm, I watch you go in the bowl. I'm like, this is going to be entertaining. I'm like, the truck's so long. I don't think he'll flip it. I think he'll be okay. Um, and I looked over, and you're driving this Daisy. I'm like, he is being I had it floored. I'm glad he's being sensible. Wow. So. That's heartbreaking. Look, when we drove the truck, I actually tried to get stability off just to see if, if it would launch any better on a 060 testing. You can't even Nothing. turn it off. And, that's, and that to me should be illegal. And that's the first time I've been in a yeah. Ram that's done that to us. And I don't, so maybe it was a, I don't know if it's a pre-production model or just an early model. Maybe I don't know. Like it, it, you know, just, it was pre-pro. That one was a pre-pro. So maybe they're yeah. saving itself for uh, later events. I mean, which is probably smart um, because usually Rams don't do that to you. <laughs> so no, no, like the, the gas ones don't do that. They'll let you just turn yeah, off. Yeah, Maybe it was a diesel thing. I don't just know. like all the other. But, I don't know. I'm, I'm, not, not an issue. But on that point, that is, though, that was bizarre. I'm going to bring that up because that is my pick for, all right, Craig, you get to leave with one vehicle from this show. Despite that, it's the Ram 2500 Rebel diesel. Really? Yeah. So I, I do believe that was the truck I voted on for Texas because okay. I really thought it was a cool package. Because mm-hmm. my criticism of the Power Wagon that we drove last year, and for those who don't know, that's like the off roady Ram before the T-Rex was a thing. And it's a 2500, but it has less payload cap- capability than like a... Yeah, it's so confusing. I still, we and, couldn't and get an answer because, on that still, but... Well, well, you missed the State Fair. I spoke to the CEO of Ram about mm-hmm. that and, and asked him. It was off camera, but I asked him, hey, what is the deal with the payload? And he goes, it's all about the soft spring rate. No, I understand so that. It's but then just make it in a half price. ton. I guess you don't get the stick axle, though, then. 
Oh, is that the difference? Oh no, that's what okay. it was. Yeah. So power wagon. The, no, yeah, the whole mantra because they talked about that in a brief um, during the concept of power wagon before when it when it came out. It was about the military style live action. Uh, that whole. So concept. you got to keep it in three quarter ton. And uh, yeah, that's the whole idea. And so they basically said makes sense. Uh, flex over towing is what they decided. And it does that. And, and, and nobody's fine. business. It, does it really well? Yeah, it's probably the better rock crawler than like a Raptor or two. I mean, that's one of the vehicles we drove last year on the technical course. That was very, very technical and hard to do. Uh, did it? It was boring. It, it. it was very boring in that. Yeah, it laughed yeah. at it completely. But I would, whereas like a front a frontier like got stuck on the back right. And it didn't, the, yeah, it just didn't get stuck on anything. But right. the so. anyways, I would take that home because we've driven the twenty five hundred diesel Rams before. They just they ride so well. You've got the coil suspension on a three-quarter yeah. ton, which is insane. The Cummins That's diesel, amazing. I'm sorry. Look, I don't think there's any secret that we're not the biggest diesel fans around, but I love the Cummins diesel. It's, it's my favorite three-quarter ton diesel. But I'm sorry. It just is. It, yeah. Um, Man, let, can, let's just elaborate on yeah. that a little bit because I could totally agree with you. you I'm, I'm less diesel than you mm. are. Um, I, I mean, well, that's not really fair. We both feel like diesels are a use case scenario. If you tow weekly, freaking get yeah. a diesel, dude. That that's going to be the best tool for the job. If you don't tow, you have a boat that you tow twice a year. Just save your money. Just get the gas. It rides better. It's cheaper. Blah blah yeah. blah blah. It's just a more sensible buy. Um, diesels are complicated to maintain. They need def fluid. They're mm. Just all that crap. The mechanic rates are higher. It's just everything. Right. Um, I've owned diesels. You've had diesels through work and that kind of stuff. We both were like, yeah, we get it. It's not for our personal use, so let's just make <laughs> right. one. Um, but I'll tell you, the Ram is the most charming diesel out there. In fact, when we were driving, I kept thinking, like, I'm getting those those vibes of, like, why someone wants a diesel. It's like, it makes the sounds. I, I keep joking with school bus saying, there is a nostalgia for, for men remembering being little boys on a school bus somehow <laughs> on their Bluebird bus with a Cummins 12 valve in it. It's like... That's what's going on there. There's like memories tied to that somehow, and it makes the right sounds in the right way. Mm-hmm. Yet it's still an inline six. It's very smooth. You get into like the Ford Power Stroke, which does make more power flat out. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like a science experiment the mm-hmm. whole time. It feels industrial and 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 not in like a cool way, but like we got the number way. Yeah, no, and it, and it works. Like, I don't. And so does the Duramax. They both sure, work. They're both sure. great. They're all great diesels. I just. I don't want to even remotely think about touching working on. I guess I don't want to work on any modern diesel these days. Let's be honest, but the Cummins still feels true, like it'd be true. a little more like approachable. Cummins, but maybe, maybe it's not. I don't know. Maybe it's not. That might be true. We may be talking yeah. on that, but it, it does give you the impression that it's the most straightforward diesel right. out there, the simplest of them. I think. Right. So. Um, so you know. Yeah. No, that's cool. That being said, that's the one I would the, the pick. The Rebel's a good. I think it looks well. I think it's it's got the, you know the Duratrac tires, just like the Power Wagon. So you get all the looks of the power wagon and yeah. a little bit of its capability, but the, their application of the diesel is cool. And for a, usually there's a big trade off of diesels, like the diesel off road version trimmer, the, F, the Ford version, is just will knock mm-hmm. your literal teeth out. And this doesn't this horribly. doesn't do that. Yeah. And so I could actually live with it. And um, there's sometimes it'd be nice to have that. And I like the package that was in. So that's what I would pick. Anyways. I, I agree. I think it looks really cool. And, and I want to actually talk about some of the comments we've had on the videos we have put out on that already because we were able to do some like walk around mm-hmm. stuff with it already. Um, we just can't do driving impressions on it. Um, in fact, we probably shouldn't have talked about how it drove at all. We haven't. So pretend like that was Well, I was talking about old Ram legend. 2500 diesels. They ride well. Oh, we have driven yeah. that. And this is just very similar like that. To potentially. Anything. So anyways, what I'm getting at is potentially, uh, allegedly. Um, what I'm getting at is that it looked cool as hell. You have all the cool looks of the power wagon. You get the the hood and the color and the the two tone black and blue and the the wheels and tires and all that crap. But if you, it, there is a what I'm getting at is we get comments where people go, "Oh, well, you can't offer a diesel; it's too heavy. It'll sink." Yeah, it's not a mud truck. No one said it's a mud truck. Um, well, now it can't articulate like the power wagon, so I can't go up, you know, whatever rock garden I was going to do. Look, you weren't going to anyways in the power wagon. Let's be honest, because the guy commenting drives a freaking sin truck. You're not the buyer anyways. But there is a person that wants that look but still does want a tow, and that's why they want a diesel. And that's who this truck is for. It, it exists, and I think there is a market for it. It's not going to be huge, but there is a buyer out there, and they're going to sell the ones that they make. They won't make a ton of right. it. Right. It'll be fine. 
Um, so it's a cool truck. Good okay, choice. your biggest um, either letdown or disappointment or kind of mm, what's the way to word this? I don't want to. I don't want to say your least favorite because it's not really fair because we weren't able to drive all, all of them. There's so many. Um, yeah, but maybe the one you drove that you were just like, eh, dang it, kind of. One I one I was expecting more yeah. from. Okay. Um, I'm gonna let you go first because there's I gotta chew on that for a second. I'm not quite sure. Yet. Oh, um, I think I'm going to. This is a tough one. The Sequoia was awesome. The Tundras were awesome. Rain was awesome. Um, because there's several that I think I would feel the way, but I didn't drive because of that. I know. I literally said because working the event, Craig, I didn't have the time to drive this like I usually do. Right. And so I said, hey, I got to pick my top 15 to drive or 10 and, and just drive those. That's it. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm chewing. I'm chewing. This is a tough one. Maybe we shouldn't have done this one. This is a bad. <laughs> because, um, <laughs> okay, look. Um, the HRV. I drove the HRV. The Honda. You did? Okay. They're uh, smaller than CRV. Yeah. And this isn't really answering your question because I, I expected literally nothing from okay. it. Um, so I wasn't really disappointed, but on the morning testing, we did put it on an obstacle that I thought it could make and it certainly could mm. not. Um, now we did not have to pull it out. Oh wait, no, I've got the answer for you, Craig. Never mind. Forget the HRV because HRV actually, when I drove it actually did better than I thought it would on the hill climb with the CVT. Um, I'm going to say the one I was least impressed with was the Subaru. Okay, so I was wondering why that didn't pop up first. I was trying to save that for you. So <laughs> yeah, I, I literally couldn't think of it. Um, and that's because I went through an obstacle that the Subaru team and I had discussed all day. And they asked if they thought it could make it through the water pit, uh, which is the hardest obstacle in terms of, well, maybe not the hardest. It just depends on, on, on the design of the air intake and that kind of stuff of the vehicle. Because the, the Subaru Forester actually did both Brock Gardens. Okay. I was really impressed. I didn't take him over that, uh, but they did. And I watched it and I was like, wow. And, and it just did it. And it, it scraped a little bit, but it had skid plates in those places, and it was fine. So total props to Subaru for even bringing it out to an event like this. Because let's be honest, the, the Forester Wilderness is the Instagram campsite car, <laughs> not necessarily a Moab vehicle. Um, but it was impressive in that regard. So when I did finally get around to driving it, I said, hey, have you done the water pit? They said, yes, we've done it twice, and it had no problem. Please do it. So Okay. So I go to do it and I'm pulling through and um, I'm just going to tell, forget, I'm just going to tell the story. I get in and they said, you know, the previous journalist to drive through here, if you could crawl a little bit slower, because the way the front is designed, it splashes a lot. We're just trying to keep water off the hood. So, okay. So I crawled through. I didn't splash anything up, took it super slow, but it waded through. And I've actually seen it go through. It's actually above the door line, the bottom of the door. Uh, where it meets the body just a little bit, but not to the point the water's coming in the car. But, you know, I wouldn't want to camp there too long. So um, with that in mind, I roll through and I go to pull out, and the front tires are just coming out of the water hole, and it's not going anywhere, Craig. I am giving it full throttle, mm -hmm. and I look down, and it's at 1,000 RPM. I go, oh, that's weird. So I let off the gas, and it drops down to 800, which is its idle, right around there, 8, 850 is its normal idle. That's odd. I was like, give it some more gas. And no one's recognized. And I have two other people with me in the car that are brand reps. They haven't realized what's going on yet. And um, I give it gas and it starts to roll backwards. And I go, okay. I go back to the brake. I go, oh, guys, we're not going anywhere. Uh, it's not happy. There's no warning lights. There's nothing going on there. Um, but I start to feel the engine stumble a little bit. And so I'm concerned about water coming in the vehicle. So I open the door and I see that we are now above the water. And, but I'm still not sure in my mind if we ingested water. That's my concern is that we've ingested water. I'm going, this is not good. Um, but seeing it go through previously, like I don't think it was even eligible to ingest water, especially at a crawl's pace. So anyways, moral of the story, our spotter comes by. He's saying, hey, are you disabled? Is it stuck? Blah, blah, blah. I'm telling him, let it go because there's a drone flying over me who's filming mm -hmm. this. There's a photographer that's getting shots. I don't want this vehicle on camera getting towed if it's not necessary. <laughs> um, moral of the story, Craig, long story short, I restarted a few times. At this point, the AC quits working. Um, 
it's gone into a limp mode. That's what's mm. happened here. It's not like AC blew up. It's just it's trying to save itself and conserve power for some reason. But it did come up to have a misfire. Uh, it was it was running on maybe two or three cylinders, not all four. Um, on the third restart, it came back to life. It let me rev in neutral. I get it about four thousand RPM. It wasn't stumbling. It wasn't missing. It wasn't coughing or ingesting like like, like if it's gotten some water and it didn't have that at all, and um, no steam or anything. And then I go to put it in gear and give it gas. Same thing. Won't move. Um, so we do this a few more times. It comes like a life. I get it out of the hole. Actually drives itself out. Uh, but there was about 10 minutes, almost 10 minutes in the water pit, um, not able to pull to drive it out on its own power. So that was really concerning. And um, I was, I'll be honest with you. I'm pretty disappointed with that. I, I do think it was a fluke. Um, I don't know if there's a, a wiring harness that maybe got wet down there, but I am confused because there was no warning light whatsoever. There was no like, Hey, call your dealer. There was no wrench light. There was nothing like that that would let the driver know something's going on. So we get it out of the water hole. We open the hood. You can see where we were in the water. It was nowhere near even the oil pan, the way that motor's placed in the car. The oil pan was not touching water. Um, control arms were, but it's mounted so high. Like the, there was air did not, or water did not get into that engine. There's no way at all. And um, so at this point, Subaru guys are not very talkative. Um, they're a little upset about their vehicle doing this. And, um, I said, well, you know, can we do the rock garden now? Let's let this thing air out a little bit. They go, yeah, that's fine. We do the rock garden. It did great. Um, but at this point the AC would not return. So the compressor would not come on. The fan is blowing and it's hot. It's probably 95 degrees. Um, and out of all three of us, none of us wanted to be the person to crack that window to get some fresh air because they would acknowledge that there was a problem <laughs> with the air conditioner. It can be an oppressive event and, and have um, a problem with the car. That's usually not good. The, no, especially when you only have one, um, one available for, for people to drive. And uh, moral of the story, the drive back to base camp from the track is about, what would you say, about eight minutes, yeah. five to eight minutes, depending where you're at. By the time we got back to the main gate, the AC kicked back on, and I couldn't help it, Craig. I wasn't trying to be rude. I went... Oh, AC's back. I cut the guy off from his conversation. <laughs> and, and I was like, oh, and we're all like, oh, thank God, the AC's back. Like, oh, that's great. It's great. And uh, so it had healed itself the time we got back in typical Subaru fashion. So that's good. Um, I will say, though, we didn't see that the rest of the event because it was removed for uh, some diagnostics. So it, it did come back the next day. Oh, I'm sorry. The rest of the evening. Yes. I apologize. The rest they, of the evening. They, they, it did actually. But they didn't go through the water pit anymore. Night, but yeah. That was yeah, done. So. Yeah. Yeah, that was done. Um, so Which is my, bizarre, but you know, no, that's a good one, and I was, ho- was hoping you, that's one you would pick because that's a that's a crazy story and kind of, uh, I mean, not what you want if you're super rude, but um, like you say, probably a one off, no. but uh, definitely it happened though, so it's a, you know, it is what it is. We have to report yeah. it. I mean, look, I, it, we can't hide it. Yeah. It happened, and I don't think this is a by and large problem, but it is our experience with it. So, so. mine would be surprisingly because this is a vehicle I almost took home. This is probably my second place winner, but the Acura MDX um, mm. Type S or whatever, I don't know what they're calling it. Um, it's type got S, the, which is the turbo. It's got V6. the new three liter turbo V6. The packaging of it's really neat. Mm-hmm. Um, makes plenty of power. Um, but again, they're, they're sure. lying to us. It's all in the name of emissions. So quit trying to tell me you're trying to get more power. You're <laughs> lying to me. It's not any faster or any yeah. more powerful necessarily real world wise. It's all because they need better emissions. That's what this is about. And that's fine. That's fine. Sure. And sure. Here, but here's my disappointment. We took that out on the road and we mashed it, just like we all do, we do all of them, zero to 60 times. And it wasn't... So we actually metered yeah, them. It wasn't slow, Yeah. but for them bragging about how much more power it makes and how, much, how, much, how good this engine is, it wasn't a whole lot faster than the old 3.5 naturally aspirated. And I just... No, in fact, I think... I think you pulled numbers on. Well, actually, you own a 3.5 mm-hmm. Metro aspirated pilot, mm-hmm. right? So you know what that yeah. feels like. I'm with you. I'm look. I'm totally with you. I think it was a great product, but don't put Type S on the side. Yeah, of that. and I'm sure it's. I'm sure you it's know? faster. I don't remember the times off the top of my head. I, I have no doubt it's fast. Actually, faster. But the sensation was nothing, and there's no noise. There's not any. Not enough turbo noise. Right. And in the 3.5 naturally aspirated, you still have the VTEC. You actually hit. 5,500 and it, I mean, like, it, it's exhilarating. It's fun. You feel, you feel, you feel it. Come yes. on, damn. And yeah, we don't get really any happens. of that with yeah. this. And it's a great engine. It's going to be everything. And everybody will be happy. Don't get me wrong. But that let me down a little bit. That was probably my biggest letdown. So, can I make a parallel hmm. while we're here? 
this is their Mazda moment. Mm. This yep. um, they used to be Zoom yep. Zoom, and their their VTech was like God, and it yeah. still is, right? They just don't make right. it anymore. It's still God. It's just last year's car. Um, and, and again, this is objectively better. This is kind of like the Coyote yeah. F150 versus the EcoBoost F150. The EcoBoost is going to be more impressive. It's going to have better numbers, that kind of stuff. But it's not going to give you that that NASCAR no. sound that just gets it's your soul happening. going. That that is gone. That's true. But, but I still liked it so a that's, lot. I was still like, I agree. Okay, so. I think enough on the Texas Truck Radio. I think, Brian, we've got some vehicles behind us. We need sure. to kind of tease a little bit, talk about it a little bit, and what kind of the plans are. Not briefly, because we're going to have another podcast where we de- de- delve into that more. But we're getting close to the hour yes. mark. But let's. Uh, do you want to tease what's going on with those, what kind of our thoughts are, and uh, where people need to go to see more about those? Yeah, let's put it out there. We've been, we've been brewing on this for, what, a couple months mm-hmm. now? Right, so behind you, Craig, I'll introduce Bash the Land mm-hmm. Cruiser, which you bought earlier this summer, um, and I, you blamed it on your daughter because she needed to drive and you needed to have a center console parking brake. Yeah, that's fair. So I, I was be thinking, able to like, reach I don't over know. and pull the brake. Right, which turns out that didn't work when you bought it at a- first. Anyways, that's look your lo- at first. Yeah, your logic at the time was Brian. I've got to get a car to teach my daughter to drive in. And I got to have that parking brake that I can pull in case something's happening as if she's, you know, an incompetent ape that can't hit the brake on her own. So the, these are the things that are the excuse in your dad mind and, and car guy mind. I thought I was thinking a lot of things like an Accord has a center hand parking brake. Uh, Jetta's have those. Volkswagen. I mean, just their, their focuses have them. Anything. Your, your Gary has them, but you want it automatic. I understand that. You want to start with automatic. So naturally you came home. Yeah, with that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Which is Practical. Totally. And then as soon as it showed up, it's like, yeah, that was a good call. Yeah, very utilitarian yeah. of you, um, for sure. But, but that thing is awesome. And look, I don't want to give away all the details because we're going to dive into all that on our future works. But in your searching for that vehicle behind you, I found this. And this is an LR3 Land Rover. It's a 2007 Land Rover. Yours is a 1997. So we have a decade mm-hmm. between them. Um, and there's a big beef in the overlanding world because these are kind of the, the two leaders, that like the kings mm-hmm. of the hill. The argument is the Toyota will always feel old, but it'll always be on the top of the hill. Whereas Land Cruiser might feel fresh, but it may not <laughs> make it to the top. And I think, I think that's still a fair argument. So we have, um, we, and I won't get all the details, but I bought this kind of as a joke and it turned out it was pretty good. And then I ended up driving it daily because I liked it so much. Um, and we'll get to that on our new channel, Craig. I think it's fair mm-hmm. to say that we're going to start a new channel that is not a part of Texas Truck Channel. It will be on YouTube. I've actually made the handle, but it's not live yet. It's going to be called Unplugged Garage. And this is going to be a place where we get to just go freehand on all kinds of cool stuff. We can spend time on our personal vehicles, our projects, and things that we want to work on that are not good, vehicle related. And so that's what we're doing. We've oh. got um, we've got these two that are going to be. Hey, lost, Brian. Do we need to restart or anything? Hello. Hi. And that might have been it for Brian. If you're still listening, I think I've lost you. Well, I'll finish for Brian. So, what Brian was getting into is there's going to. Hey. Oh, are you back? I've been here the I whole time. Lost you with uh, bandwidth. It sounds like so. Um, you're explaining what Unplugged Garage is about. So l- let's just cut this and we'll we'll restart the end. How about probably that? not? We're just gonna roll with it. So go ahead. Oh, okay. All right. Because um, <laughs> I already explained it once. You were just gone for it. That's all. No, no one got it. I was here. Oh, okay. You. Oh, that's right. You're recording on your end. That's fine. Okay, all right, so Unplugged Garage, Craig, is going to be our new channel for things that are not press car related. It's going to be for these two vehicles that are behind us. These are our personal project cars. These are not our daily drivers. We have other cars for that. Um, these are really meant to be going head-to-head. What is the better overlander And well, today? viewers, we're going to the end it there the for some one, reason. Uh, we keep gonna having some bandwidth issues. Who knows? The internet's going the slower at night. King of the Hill. I live out in the sticks. Ryan lives closer to the city. And, probably has some oil and so we're going to so end it here in case you uh, you're not out, getting go the full story. Garage, but and we moral of the story is Unplugged Garage. We're going to talk about a lot of different things on there. 
we might have some EV rants that continue there. We have some project cars that Brian was talking about. Anyways, basically things that aren't necessarily press cars and some of our personal cars. Um, with that, thanks for listening and stay tuned for another episode, hopefully sooner than the last one. But um, hopefully you like this new video format too. We haven't tried that. Give us your feedback on there. It'll be on YouTube and all the other podcast networks. Thanks for listening.